Hi everyone, just before we get this next history hack out and going, just a quick reminder that there are lots of ways you can support the pod. Remember just by liking, subscribing and sharing it with your friends, that is invaluable as it gets the word out and our witterings can go far and wide. But if you're able to support us financially, that would be incredible because it helps us keep doing what we're doing. In the description to this episode, there are links to Patreon where you can support the podcast regularly and Ko-Fi where you can tip us for an episode that you like. But we've also got some merch. So if you head to shop.historyhackpod.com, you'll be able to see some incredible bits of merchandise featuring the incredible designs that Steve Smith does for every episode. We've got some totes on there, some mugs, and we've got more stuff coming all the time. So please do check that out. And if you are able to support us financially, that is incredible. Thank you so much. But even if it's just liking, sharing, and telling everyone we're incredible, that helps us too. So without further ado, hello and welcome to History Hack. We have a very sweet episode for you today. And we think we're going to have a lot of fun with this one because not only... Are we going to be talking about sweeties? I'm joined by the wonderfully sweet Bethany Moore, who's going to introduce our guest. Thank you very much, Matt. It's a pleasure to to join up you to uh, carry out this podcast. I'm really looking forward to this one as the resident history hack sweet consumer. We are joined by Paul Crystal today. And Paul, when you read his biography, he's, he's someone quite astounding, really. I've, I've loved reading all of his books and I've done a co- read a couple of his other be- pieces of work as well. It's absolutely fantastic. So he has a background in classics where he's had degrees from the universities of Hull and Southampton. He's worked in medical publishing and he's spent a lot of time as a historical advisor for organisations such as the National Trust, has written for national newspapers and done a lot of broadcast work for various BBC radio stations. Since 2010, he's written over 120 books and articles published on a wide range of topics from social and military history and classical history, all the way through to topics on food, including our book today, which is The History of Sweets, which I think has one of the best covers I've ever seen for a book. So hello, Paul, welcome to History Hack. Hello, sounds like Desert Island Disc, eh? (laughs) we like to keep it nice simple and flowy so thank you so much for joining us Paul so I will just start off with the most basic of questions I suppose when you talk about sweets what makes a sweet sweet and where do the origins of confectionery lie that's a good question actually the word sweet is originally old English although there are sort of crossovers with um, Scandinavian and old Germanic languages and the old English word sweet, S-W-E-T-E, uh, was originally used to describe something that was pleasing for the senses, mind or feeling and having a pleasant disposition. So it didn't take long for the word to be applied to something that was sweet to the taste in much the same way as it also referred to a beloved one or someone who is a what we call now or used to call in the 50s and 60s a sweetheart. Sweet is basically just that, it's sweet and that's what makes a sweet a sweet. A sweet is sugar or sugar substitutes, the main constituent of a sweet. So it isn't difficult to see why uh, we call sweets sweets. Sugar confectionery is a similar sort of thing, it is a sweet, it's any sweet confection and that takes in chocolate, chewing gum, bubble gum, fudge sugar candy as well as other types of sweet. So sweet, the sweet, a sweet, sweets, is quite straightforwardly something that is sweet and that we like. Wonderful. And so it's not just sweets as we know them it has a long history, doesn't it? You know, it starts back in ancient history with honey and nuts, doesn't it? Rather than yeah. the refined sugar that we would think of. Yeah, well, before sweets in the format that we associate with sweets, I small, very easily eatable tablets of, of sugar and sugar confectionery. Before that, the, the way that the Greeks and Romans, for example, and other ancient civilizations, the way they got their sweet shot was through honey, a mixture usually of honey and nuts and other nice things that we associate really with, I suppose, Greek sweets and the Turkish sweets and Indian sweets, but sweets as such didn't exist. It was basically honey. Mm. 
And they've not always been the lovely snack that we know now. They've originally considered to have medicinal purposes. So the Mary Poppins, a spoonful of sugar, helps the medicine go down. That's yeah. where a lot of it came from as well, Paul, wasn't it? Well, yeah, it, it, it's quite confusing, really, because in, in the sort of early days of the sweet, there weren't really sweets, actually. They came about almost by accident in the sense that sweets were essentially tablets, as you say, as with, with Mary Poppins saying that if you coat a medicine in sugar, then it's much more palatable to the refractory child who just spat everything out if it was bitter. So basically, medicines were, were coated in sugar or honey, and that allowed them to be tolerated by children. And when the, the, the tablets were just medicinal, they were called confections. Uh, and that's where we get the word confectionery from. It didn't take long for the confectioners, which were basically apothecaries or what we call chemists now, to realise that there wasn't that much money in the medicines, but there was a lot more money to be had in sweets. So they did away with the medicinal aspect and just started selling them as sweets. And that's where we get the word confectionery, and that's where we get sweets as we know them today, which is something that people enjoy. Mm. Because there's still like a lot of sweets now that I would suppose some people might say like have medicinal elements to it, like cough drops and things. They're still very sweet and to, to make them palatable, aren't they? Anyone who's ever taken a, a cough pastel, there's two types. There's the bitter ones that uh, are not as popular as the ones where if, if, if you suck it and bite into it, then it explodes into... Uh, a mixture of honey and other sweet additives that actually make it feel sweet but it has got a, an element of medicinal in it in terms of um, it, it, it soothes your throat and it makes you feel a bit better psychologically it doesn't cure your sore throat or your cough in any way but that's what the manufacturers uh, obviously sell it on the fact that it's it is curing your cough and it's sweet at the same time definitely definitely and obviously Sweets are extremely in- enjoyable, certainly for, for myself anyway. I love I love sweets. But we all know that there are certain health aspects, you know. There's a dark side to this most enjoyable of foodstuffs, isn't there? We've got usage of e-numbers and overconsumption effects on health of obesity, dental hygiene even. So, you know, you must have come across a lot of these occasions where the sweets are actually detrimental to people's health and I must ask you as I got quite a scare when flicking through your book for the first time of finding a picture of rotten teeth in the book it gave me quite a scare well that was the intention (laughs) not you personally but (laughs) (laughs) I mean I suppose in a sense we're in denial because there's convincing evidence irrefutable evidence that uh, basically too many sweets like too many anything is not very good for you. And as you say, it has ramifications for dental health, which then translate into physical health, because if you have too many sweets and you're eating too much sugar, it rots your teeth, you end up in A&E, and A&E then have to sort it out. And one of the major reasons why children present at A&E is the fact that they've got rotten teeth and all the gums that's coming out of their gums. Talk to an A&E consultant or or registrar and they will tell you that if we could get rid of all the sugar in sweets we wouldn't see half as many pediatric patients it's a terrible thing and you could go on for it with it for, for ages you know people enjoy sweets but there is as you say the dark side and other aspects of course lead to diabetes type 2 usually uh, and also to obesity and they have all sorts of chronic health problems which cost the health service tons of money every year and also it leads to a shortening of your lifespan but you know government successive governments but particularly this one uh, the current one is saying well okay we're advising companies to do this and to do that but it's not mandatory it's voluntary which company that's making billions of dollars or pounds every year on flogging sweets to the market is going to change very much certainly in terms of the sweetness which is what attracts people to sweets in the first place it's got to be mandatory but it won't be. Absolutely. I guess we could add in the proliferation of sugar in just about everything. Yeah, it's not it's not just sweets, it's cornflakes and everything, as you say. It's very prevalent, isn't it, really? I, I was thinking it as I was reading your book. Is it potentially a hang-up on the fact that in past generations, 
sugar was always an expensive product to buy. And as the world has become increasingly smaller and smaller and smaller, and these products are easier to to get our hands on, then you had rationing in the Second World War. And it just seems that as we've had more accessibility to these kind of products, then the problem has become greater. I speak to my grandparents. My granddad has an excessive sweet tooth, but he grew up in the Second World War where as a small child where you didn't have access to those kind of products? Well, it's interesting. There's a woman called Hannah Newton, who, who's a science historian at Cambridge. Basically, she maintains, and she's got evidence for this, that it's a common misconception that children's preference for sweet over bitter flavours is a modern phenomenon. It's mm. not. It's been going on for, for generations and mm. centuries She says it's a a reflection of infant's biology. It's a mechanism for survival. Just as pain tells the child that, you know, something's up and they've got to do something to counter it, taste buds are are exactly the same. If a child, a baby, tastes something that's bitter, it's going to react to it and reject it. Taste buds are formed in the fetus at seven weeks gestation and within hours of birth, infants reject bitter tastes in preference for sweet ones. So it's always been with us, you know, from time immemorial. I don't really know that uh, we can say that it's a modern phenomenon. It's not. It's be, always been there. Given the availability of sweets, as you say now, and given the option to have something sweet or bitter, mm. the human being is always going to go for the sweet one. Mm. I mean, that's interesting research, but research is all very well. But if you can't implement it for the common good, it's not much point to it. But uh, we're banging ahead against the... The usual brick wall on this. Mm. People get a lot of psychological pleasure from it. And, mm. you know, that's got to be a good thing because we do need psychologically, particularly at the moment, lots of good things rather than bad mm. things. Absolutely. With the sweets I get through, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> How are your teeth? Do you know what? Surprisingly good touch wood. I don't have any fillings or anything like that. Yeah, that's because you're brushing your teeth properly. That's what that is. Yeah. So you're counteracting it. I've watched you demolish a whole tub of sweets on some of our recordings, but how are your teeth in such amazing condition? I, don't know. <laughs> I had to have multiple teeth taken out and braces as a teenager. So I think then I went the opposite extreme after the braces came off because I wasn't allowed any sweets for two and a half years. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not a dentist, by the way. So. <laughs> I, I oh, don't. After too many movies of dentistry i'm I'm off dentist and i need to go see one but let's talk about my favorite type of sweet let's get on to the chocolate here i do feel this question is loaded because it does bring us back to birmingham but the history of chocolate is absolutely fascinating because it's not just the sweets that we've been talking about so far but it goes way back to time and memorial but it also is also the sort of chocolate bar that we know now is very much a, a, a british invention is it not Well, it is and it isn't. Basically, as you probably realise, it all goes back to the the Incas, the the, the Mexican civilizations, and such like. And, you know, they loved their sweets. Montezuma III was was a real uh, avid sweet advocate. And basically, he liked sweets, not so much because they were tasty, but but he he thought they were an aphrodisiac. So the more sweets he had, the more, I suppose, good sex he was expecting. (laughs) Anyway, you know, things didn't turn out too well for. Montezuma, particularly when Cortes the killer arrived and basically took his kingdom away from him. He went back to Spain with the recipe that he'd stolen from Montezuma and things really kicked off in Spain originally. And then when the traders started calling at Spanish ports, they were they were presented with this, this concoction, mainly, I suppose. It's, it, was, it was much more akin to what you describe as gritty cocoa now. And it was, it was, for many years, it was in a liquid form. But anyway, the Dutch got hold of it and we got hold of it, came back to Amsterdam and to London and such like. And eventually it, it, it developed into a solid sort of confection. The reason for that was that we had all of this cocoa stuff that was left from the, the liquid version of it and no one really knew what to do with it. And there's a guy in Holland called Van Houten, who basically, I suppose, is the godfather of chocolate because he invented a machine that actually made a good sort of fist at producing chocolate as we know it now in slabs. 
And if it wasn't for the Van Houten machine, we'd still be drinking gritty cocoa. But he developed it. Companies like Cadbury, Fry and Terry's took it on board. Roundtree were very sceptical about it, possibly because it wasn't English and it was foreign and all that stuff. Cadbury, Fry uh, and the other manufacturers in, in France and so on, they took it, they embraced it and they st started producing chocolate as we know it. Yeah, and that, that's how it started. If, if you've ever been to Cadbury World, you'll get a good idea of how chocolate was produced in the early days and how it's produced now. Fascinating day out, Cadbury World. Beth has season tickets. <laughs> that I can attest to. As a... Have you been? Yeah, I'm from the area. I'm not a Brummie, but I do live very close by. And it's a rite of passage for anyone in the Midlands. You have to go to Cadbury World. I mean, you drive oh, through at the right time of day and there's a smell of chocolate around the whole area. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm in York and you still get that here with the Kit Kats. Mm. Yeah. It's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I, I live in the countryside. Really? We get different smells out here. Yeah. <laughs> but this sweet and chocolate trade, all of the, the nice things that we like to enjoy, you know, whether you have them as a snack throughout the day or you have your chocolate bar after your dinner or something, it is a multi million dollar pound industry isn't it it's such a huge huge market with such a huge audience with some of the most iconic pieces of advertising as well being about sweet things so you've got like yeah. the caribou bro theme song or you've got the milk tray man or like cadbury's with the gorilla playing yeah. the drums it's so iconic why do you think that sweets and sweet manufacturers sweet producers seem to have hit on a really magic formula of being able to make their products really identifiable and really iconic yeah. and it really does have quite a hold on on the public imagination i think well as you say we all still remember adverts like uh, the lady loves milk tray mm -hmm. the cadbury's fry adverts sort of quasi erotic thing. don't forget the fruit gums polo the mint with a the hole they all speak to the market basically and that's the essence of good marketing and good advertising they speak to ordinary people with the slogans and mm -hmm. you know the tapping into james bond or the saint and you know that sort of thing so the, the chocolate companies were very clever they had to be because the competition was so great mm -hmm. when fry were launching something or cat terry's they had to spend money on the good agencies and the good agencies were the ones that came up with the goods so they appreciated that sweets are a universal in most countries, kids eat sweets and adults eat sweets. So, you know, they had a wide audience. They knew that once it had gone from radio onto television, that audience was, you know, basically a uh, captive market. You know, in the middle of Coronation Street, mm -hmm. stick an advert on for sweets and you were laughing. A good few of them are unforgettable. You know, they really are. And it wasn't just on telly as well. Some of the adverts in the papers, magazines, still, you know, they're still iconic. And, uh, well, I hate the word iconic, but in, in those days, they really were because you can still see them in, in your mind's eye. You go on eBay and it's full of the reproduction sweet adverts. Sweets are very nostalgic. Mm -hmm. We all remember the gobstoppers and the chewing gum, the bubble gum, all sorts of things. And uh, that goes back to lots of things like summer holidays. We remember the good summer holidays and we remember the good sweets. It's like that phrase, child in a sweet shop, isn't it? You know, because it's that just that amaze, the, the wonder of seeing a wall full yeah. of sweets. You've got it absolutely right. That's exactly what it is. And there's a couple of pictures in the book that shows how literally gobsmacked the child is when it's the prospect of spending their threepence pocket money on some sweets that came out of a jar and were poured into a, a paper flute and then you'd get them out of the shop and you'd, you'd scoff them all. It's not one of the questions we prepped you with, Paul, so I'm going to throw this one in. You can, refu <laughs> you can refuse to answer it if you want. The thing I've always yeah. found fascinating as well with sweets and advertising is the differentiation between posh sweets and not posh sweets. And I suppose the, yeah, the, the classic one for that is the Frere Rocher, isn't it? Yeah, that's been yeah. served at the ambassador's dinner, whereas your bar of dairy milk is sort of your, your bog standard. Yeah, or your Mars bar. Mm. Yeah. Has it always been like that? Have we always tried to make some sweets better than other sweets? If you look at the old catalogues, which are brilliant pieces of art in themselves, the Rex catalogues for companies like Terry's, like Cadbury, like Craven, which is a lesser known company, 
But if you look at them, you know, the, the amount of money that companies spent on their seasonal catalogs, particularly the Easter and Christmas ones, it's phenomenal. They'd have someone draw uh, the suite and then they'd have another person paint the colours in. And you know, they're, they're works of art, they really are, and fascinating. So when you had companies like Terry's doing the selection box, basically, well, not a selection box, but the, the box of sweets that had 23 different flavours and fillings in, that was a bit posh. It was it was a posher than your Spangles or, you know, your M&Ms later on. So they were a bit poshed up and you'd spend a bit more money on them. And as time went by, then obviously as, as disposable income increased, as it did in the 60s and 70s, boxes of chocolates got posher as well. Until you got to the zenith of them, which I suppose is what you said, Ferrero Rocher. Everyone likes a Ferrero Rocher. But the advertising was quite clever because it, it made Joe Bloggs in the street feel as though he was something of an ambassador when he gave his, his, his box of chocolates to his, his wife or partner or whatever. So, yeah, that was very clever. And they were posh sweets. They were poshly wrapped individually, and they came in posh boxes. But it also meant you feel a bit posh as well. I guess it just reflects my, my soul that I do like a, a good dark chocolate. Well, again, you know, there's, there's all sorts of stuff about the, the difference between milk and dark chocolate. Dark chocolate has got proven benefits to heart health and such like you know, obviously you only take a few you know you have one or two a day but if you know if you've got a chronic heart disease it does help to, to a small extent yeah. so yeah keep taking the dark chocolate I, I keep saying that to my doctor i do eat a lot of dark chocolate and he's like not that much yeah what does he say <laughs> she say <laughs> i don't think you're supposed to be eating that much to help your heart right they always say yeah, yeah. Something silly like two squares a day. I was I heard on the on Radio Four the other day. How big are the squares? Though? Like, <laughs> how big is, is that? It? <laughs> square can be a whole bar, can't it? Well, yeah, that's one square, right? Surely, if you think about it, one block, one yeah. square, you eat it in one go, one square. <laughs> if you if you rub rub the little indents out, you can make it all one one big block. Yeah, yeah. I think. The makeup of sweets is fascinating, and you know, chatting to Beth about your book is some of the little little tidbits and fascinating little stories about the history of the sweets that we know so well. And I guess, Paul, what what is sort of the the favourite bits that came up in your research? I think it was Beth was saying about polos being delayed by thirty years or something silly like that. The Nazis, I mean, they were so desperate to get uh, Labans around and invaded Poland in 1939 without any consideration whatsoever for round sheets, who were desperately trying to launch Polo and had to delay it for some considerable amount of time because uh, you couldn't really launch a, a Polo in the middle or the beginning of a war. So, yeah, because the, the invasion took place around about the same time as the launch was scheduled, they had to delay it uh, for some time, yeah. which was a shame, really, because uh, they'd spent a lot of money prepping the market for it, and uh, it couldn't be for a while. Yeah, but polos are fascinating in themselves. It's the only sweet that is famous for what's not there, rather than what is there, because it's famous for the hole in the middle, which is basically the confectionery equivalent to a black hole. You can't really get to it because it doesn't exist. I remember reading in the book, you'll have to correct me if I've mixed myself up, but you wrote something about it's a, the love heart sweets with, you know, with the phrase, yeah. I love you. And there was something about the flavours, wasn't there? How the flavours became the flavours for what the drumstick lollies. Love hearts, which we all know. Well, I don't know. You, you're maybe too young. No, oh, I remember no, love heart. I, I love a love yeah. heart. <laughs> Beth knows all sweets. <laughs> They started well before the Love Hearts hit the market. Terry's of York that sort of invent them. And they were basically just sweets that had those messages on, which eventually became Love Hearts. And they were very, very popular. There was something that you were referenced about. There was a child that were involved with tasting the process and then the flavours became the raspberry and, uh, and like the milky flavour that you associate with the drumstick lollies. I can't remember it exactly off the top of my head, but it was a, it was a fascinating little uh, little section of all these little facts and like Palm of Violets as well. Incredibly underrated sweet, the Palm of Violet. <laughs> I've not actually heard of that sweet that you just mentioned. Palm of, what's Palm of, oh, this, this, yeah. 
<laughs> caveat this i am it's foreign so that's you are foreign <laughs> i love palmer violets but they've got a bit of a like some people really 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 don't like them and they're almost like a marmite i almost feel like palmer violets are one of the many the, one of the sweets i would say are the marmite of the sweet world because people either really really love them or really really hate them there doesn't seem to be anyone who just goes eh, they're all right yeah, the smell alone tells it's a palmer violet and nothing else. Yeah, it's very iconic. Absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, we've heard Matt's favourite is he loves a good bit of dark chocolate, and we know that I am a complete aficionado for sweets of all varieties. But if I had to, if I had to pick one sweet, of all sweets, then. one sweet <laughs> of all sweets, I'd probably have to go very classic. I'd probably have to go with something like a lemon sherbet. I love a lemon sherbet. So obviously, with this book being about sweets, we can't not ask you, Paul. What's your favourite sweet? Well, I, I like things like lemon sherbets because mm. when when you've sucked them for a bit and then you crunch them with your molars, yeah. they do explode with the sherbet, and that. That is quite a sensation, mm. really. And I, I remember every Sunday after we'd listened to, well, I didn't listen to it, it was on the radio, you'd have the Billy Cotton Band show, you then have your Sunday roast. And then my mum used to give us, me and my brother, some money to go down to the sweet shop and we could get a load of sweets. And then we'd come back and watch a John Wayne film or something like that. That was a typical Sunday. It never changed for years until we went and lived abroad and there was no Billy cotton band show and those sweet shops like you have in England so anyway we'd we'd do that and you know any sweet like that was 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 something that you like but I suppose as I got older I think the two 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 sweets that I did like best and probably were chocolates really one was a crunchy mm. and one was a bounty bar oh. and the thing about them was the first thing you did with it obviously unwrap it and then you'd start nibbling away at the chocolate mm. on the outside until you were left with the honeycomb. And then you'd eat the honeycomb separately. And the same applied to a bounty bar. You'd eat the chocolate round the side and then you'd be left with all of that, that sweet coconut. Yeah, so I still like them. I must admit, though, because for various reasons, I've never had either for probably about the last 10 years. But they're, they're the sort of things I liked. And uh, they're still making them, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Oh, crunchies are crunchies are a good one. Like yeah, a... not good for your teeth. Though. No, no. I think if there was something uh-huh. I had to pick as well, I, I do love I do love Harry I can just sit there. Oh, and yeah. as Matt can attest to, I will demolish a whole bag of Skittles in one go. So, you know, anything yeah. really, I think is is for most people. If you put something in front Skittles. of them, it's just yeah. go for it. <laughs> I remember Skittles. Do you know where the word, the name, the brand name Haribo comes from? I do, but I can't remember it. So let us know, Paul and our listeners. <laughs> well, it, was a, it was the first part of the family-owned company's founder, Hans Regal. So it's H-A, mm. yeah? And then he stuck an I in it. And the B-O comes from Bonn, German city, where the company was founded. Simple as that. Mm. That's, you know, that's another example of where simplicity lasts mm. forever. It's, it's a very German sort of concoction, same with sort of Adidas as well, being Adidas. Yeah. This yeah. is remove some letters yeah. and put it all together. <laughs> We've got ourselves a yeah. brand. There's quite a few examples of that. Jelly Babies have got a real good story. They were called Peace Babies mm. when they were first developed after the end of the First World War. And then they, they morphed into um, Jelly Babies. Mm. And then they psychologically they satisfy the human need for cannibalism because everyone bites the head off first. Oh, they? see, I don't go head first. I go feet first and make them, yeah. <laughs> <that's> like, <I'm laughs> make them suffer. <laughs> yeah, that's a gender thing, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I always went for the head. Then at least you know you've got a dead jelly baby. I always give them a, a squidge first. I, I don't know what that says about me. Yeah, they were peace babies. As you know, if you look through the book, there's loads of uh, yeah stuff in it like that. Yeah. Yeah, be, yeah. Being being Canadian, we do have some weird and wonderful sweets of, of our own. And yeah, well, I mean, Mars must have had a big impact in Canada, did yeah. it? Mars bars and such like, which very complicated when they transferred over to Europe. 
what one question while, while we've got you here, another one we haven't prepped you for really, is does a sweet necessarily have to be sugary goodness? Because Beth and I were talking about licorice earlier. So yeah. where, where does no. that come in? Because we're, we're opposites here. She's a non-licorice sort of person, whereas... No, I, I, I can't I deal with licorice. <laughs> licorice is, 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 a, is a story on its own. And a lot of it is grown very close to where I am now. It's grown in South Yorkshire, basically. And there's a licorice triangle, which goes from just south of uh, Sheffield up to Leeds. And that's where most of... Uh, the licorice is made. There's probably about seven or eight licorice companies based around Pontefract. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get Pontefract cake from and such like, which are made from licorice. John Betjeman actually wrote a poem for licorice fields at Pontefract, who were so famous and uh, so unique in a way. But yeah, there was loads of companies uh, that just made all the money out of selling licorice. But yeah, you either like it or you don't. I didn't know it was yeah. a Yorkshire thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, very much so. That's fantastic. My mind is slightly blown by all the licorice I've had in all the places around the world, and its its roots are Yorkshire. Probably from Yorkshire. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of rhubarb as well. Not, not a lot of people know that most of the rhubarb in in, in the UK is grown uh, is grown around here, around about Leeds. It's uh, yeah, it's a rhubarb city. Really. I do like a good rhubarb and custard. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Try rhubarb and licorice together. See what that's like. Two very different reactions there from yes. <laughs> yes, dear listener, if you could see the video, my face lit up and that's went very dark very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Rhubarb, yes. Yeah. Licorice, no. no. Oh, we're we're going to have to bring you around to the dark ways. Thank you for joining us, Paul, because that has been utterly fascinating. And I am now, I'm oddly craving licorice just to annoy Beth. Well, yeah, get online. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be able to get some on the Amazon by tomorrow by three o'clock. And we, we just like to say we, we should make sure that your book is on our bookshop as well. It is one of the most beautiful book covers I've ever seen. I did just sit and yeah. stare at it going, this just is a beautiful cover to look at. <laughs> well, I'm glad you said that. I'm just, it is, it is eye-catching, if nothing else. It was originally a hardback with a, a, a plate section, then they... They looked at it and they looked at the plates and they said, oh, we need more plates and and um, we'll put it right through the book. Well, the suites clearly photograph very well because that is quite some cover. Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. That's been no, a pleasure. Thank you for joining us, Paul. I've loved, I've loved this episode.